But you could grow up with a theology and a religion that teaches that kind of discipline. That God's trying to, God's trying to get even with you. God has a bat in his hand. You know, people say, so I'm going to step away based on what you said because I don't want that lightning bolt to hit me. That, that's a petty, insecure God that has to use those tactics to get your attention. Hey family, I'm glad you're watching today, whether you're in Pomona or whether um, you are watching online or wherever you are around the world. Thank you, thank you, thank you for investing in your faith. We need you in the kingdom of God. God needs you in the kingdom of God. So no matter what you're going through, the lie of the enemy that tells you it's over, it's a waste, give up and quit, don't do it. Stay in the game because God needs you and someone else need you. Let's pray and let's get into our series on pain and gain. Father, thank you for the few moments we have. Father, encourage us, strengthen us, challenge us, and stretch us in any form, in any fashion. We are the, the clay and you are the potter, so have your way in us. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, I want you to stand on your feet. It's a little bit of a long of an opening passage, but it's really where we're going to stay the whole time with a few other scriptures. But it reads like this in Hebrews, the 12th chapter, in verse number 5. As you have uh, forgotten the exhortation that addressed you as sons, my son, do not take the Lord's discipline. Now, old King James says the word chastening or chastisement. So he talks about the Lord's discipline. Don't take it lightly or lose heart when you are reproved by him. It says, for the, Lord's discipl the Lord disciplines the one he loves. It's a sign you're his. It's a sign you're part of the family. It says, and punishes every son he receives. Enduring suffering as discipline, God is dealing with you as sons, not as orphans, not as somebody who doesn't know the Lord. That's a whole different system that God operates in. He disciplines his children one way, but he disciplines the unsaved another way. But that's another message. For what son is there that a father does not discipline? So he's now drawing a natural correlation between God and our natural fathers. But if you are without discipline, which all receive, then you are illegitimate. Strong word right now. Old King James says a bastard. If you and I don't receive discipline or want discipline, he says you're a little illegitimate children and not sons. Furthermore, we've had human fathers, yes we have, and mothers, that disciplined us and we respected them. Shouldn't we submit or respect even more to the Father of Spirits, that's God, and live? For they disciplined us for a short time based on what seemed good to them. In other words, they weren't always perfect in how they disciplined. Maybe they disciplined too less or not enough, or maybe they disciplined too much. But it's drawing a comparison. God disciplines perfectly. He's a perfect heart. He's a good God. But he does it for our benefit so that we can share, already getting insight, why, in his holiness. No discipline, I know this to be true, seems enjoyable. Never do I say, I signed up for discipline. I can't wait for my God to discipline me. God, just give me the switch and the belt now. At that time, it's, it's painful. Later on, though, however, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Now, one last scripture I need to connect is found up on the top. Because when you read and interpret the Bible, you need to read the whole passage and not just exert a, a scripture out or exert a scripture out. So when he's talking about all this discipline, you have to connect it to what he said before. Let us run with endurance the race that's set before. Because you and I will never be able to run the race set before us if we don't have discipline or God's discipline. You won't finish as a father, as a husband, as a Christian, or whatever you are. You have to run with endurance in the way you do it is accepting the Lord's discipline. You may be seated. I want to take on this subject of what it means when we talk about the Lord's chastisement, the Lord's discipline. You'll see other words that help you um, to not always see the negative of it is the Lord's instructions or the Lord's correction. I have a guitar here, and we're all familiar with a guitar, but I want you to see that this is uh, unstringed. The strings are not tightened. 
It has all the potential to make a beautiful noise. It's been equipped to do a gift or a service. But because it's not been stretched or disciplined, you will not be able to enjoy the beauty of it. It's actually irritating to hear that. But when it's been tuned, it begins to produce. But the, it has to be stretched to be able to be used to its beauty. And that's a picture of God's discipline. God would not be a good God if he let us sound like this. He's got to do this, but he's got to do some twisting on us. And he's got to get us ready for whatever God wants us to get ready for. So I want to talk a little bit about this. When was the last time you were disciplined? When was the last time you felt disciplined by God? Second question, how did it make you feel or what did you do after you were disciplined by God? Was there a learning process, a growth process, a repentive process? And the last question, if Jesus, if, if Jesus was to discipline you, would you even know it? And that's what I want to challenge because I think a lot of Christians wouldn't even recognize or even know what it looks like, the discipline of the Lord. So I pray that this really liberates people and really helps people to understand. And we'll go through some bad theology in a, in a moment that really describes uh, how people have abused or they misinterpret what the chastening is and the purpose behind it. But I'm going to give you four illustrations that I think really drive what discipline looks like. It's like the discipline of a parent toward a child. So why would that father, let's say in this picture, ever have to discipline the son? Well, maybe this son talks back to the father. Maybe this son hangs around people he shouldn't hang around. Maybe this son doesn't obey the father's directions that he has for him. Maybe this son doesn't do chores or work, doesn't pick up after himself. What kind of parent, what kind of heavenly father would this be if he did not discipline his child? That's the illustration. We are the child. He is the father. So if I hang around wrong people and I talk back to God and there's a bad lifestyle in me, should I not want a level of discipline in my life? Or should I just say, you know what? I need to get away with it. God, you just need to be merciful. Uh, don't, don't, don't discipline me. That would be a bad natural father. Here's the second illustration that I want to give you. It's a soldier. The discipline that a soldier has to go through by his sergeant. He has to go through basic training. He has to go through crisis training. He's got to learn skills. He's got to get up early in the morning. He's got to get battle ready. He's got to get in shape. We all familiar, it's boot camp kind of thing, okay? Now, what kind of soldier would this be who didn't endure discipline? What kind of sergeant would this be to not prepare him for warfare through discipline? And yet we're in a war in this world Light versus darkness. And you and I don't think God's discipline is important to us? A little picture. Here's the third illustration that I think helps us. It's a teacher with their students. Should these students be required to do homework? Should these students be required to do testing? Should these requires, uh, students be required to go through courses? Would these students be, have to learn certain behaviors? What kind of teacher would there be to let these kids get away with not meeting the qualifications to graduate? And what kind of student would this be that skips out of courses or classes? That's the picture. That's the picture that God, he's like that nat natural father. He's like that sergeant. And he's now like this teacher. Okay, here's the last example I want to give us. It's an athlete. You and I are an athlete. And the, especially now going into the Olympics in, in Paris this summer, we recognize they have trained. They have, right now, everything is measured. Their sleep is measured. Their diet is measured. Their routines are measured. They've got to push their body where it's never been before. 
Pain thresholds have to be done. Intense training has to be done. Why? Because it's all about a competition. It's all about an accomplishment. It's all about a performance. All those are analogies that I'm trying to give you of truly what chastisement or discipline really looks like. We would accept it. We would, we would accept it from a military perspective, from a classroom perspective, from a parent perspective, and for an athlete perspective. Why can't we accept it as a Christian? Why is it so difficult to think along those lines that God has a right to discipline? He wants to discipline us. Understand what discipline means. Hang on. I already know where you're going. I'm going to address it in a few moments to... But I want you to watch this video that I want to share with you today. Maybe it'll help you there too. Hey climbers, how are we doing? I'm on about a 48, maybe pausing. 48 mile bike ride, over 6,000 feet in climbing uh, in Mount Bald, going up Mount Baldy. This is the ice house. And I'm here with my friend Matt back there. He's holding my bike and there's his bike and there's nothing more than experiencing pain together. Pain is tough. It's tough to do it alone, but it makes it a little easier when somebody will go through the pain with you. Did we just go through some pain right now, Matt? Yes, sir. It was very, uh, yes, sir, it is, but it's enjoyable. That's what's, what we live for. What's the steepest grade we're on right now? Um, we, we, even, we got to like the 12, 13. 12, 13 grade, and what happened? do you think the, the wind in our face was yeah. today? Climbing. Yeah, 15, 20 miles an hour. But again, the key is don't do pain alone. Do pain with somebody. I don't know if you're going through a marriage pain, a financial pain, a physical health pain, but don't do it alone. Do it with somebody. Everything worthwhile, uphill. So there's another great analogy of when we talk about discipline. You know what? Um, I, I enjoy putting my body through that pain. There's enjoyment when I get to a certain elevation and I could see snow on top of the mountains. I see animal life. The smells are alive. The beauty of that. But if I'm not willing to go through the pain of discipline, I'm never going to enjoy things that are available to me. That's what God wants us to do. He wants us to be in the best shape spiritually, the best shape financially, the best shape physically, the best shape emotionally, but you just don't roll out of bed being in shape. God's got to take you through a process of discipline. There's no way that at one time I could ride that distance, that elevation, but because I've put my body through some level of pain, now it's very easy to be able to do that. It's a great picture of the benefits and the price of a certain level of pain that God wants to take us through. But here's a great quote. It's for, from the former uh, Tour de France winner, Greg LeMond, an American. I love this quote. It never gets easier. He's talking about riding up in the Tour de France and winning. It never gets easier. You just go faster. So let me, read, let me break it down very quickly with the time that I got left. I'm going to talk about what is the what of discipline. I want to talk about the how of discipline. And I want to talk about the why of discipline. And hopefully that helps you to understand uh, what we're talking about a little deeper. The first one is the what of discipline. Let me read you a scripture here today. Do not despise the Lord's instructions. My son. No, again, we're back in Hebrews. It's, it's part of, of the attribute of a father. If you see God, you know, we sing that song, good, good, he's a good, good father, he's a good, well, if he's a good, good father, you gotta let him discipline you. If he didn't discipline you, he'd be a bad, bad father. So let's not sing the song and not welcome what he does. He just not only blesses us and gives us miracles and does things for us, but he's trying to make us the best instrument to, to, to receive, to give, to help, to make a difference. So it says, and do not loathe his discipline. Do not loathe his discipline. So I want to introduce a word to you because it's found eight times in Hebrews, which we read. It was eight times you saw the word discipline there. The Greek word is paideia. 
The Greek word is paideia there. But it's where we get the English word pediatrician. Pediatrician. So is a pediatrician an evil person, a bad person, a wrong person? No. Neither is God an evil person, a bad person, a wrong person. And that's the way he chose to use himself to describe what he brings to us in the area of discipline. The same way a pediatrician is to help heal, help bring wholeness, train the person, grow the person, give them instructions, give them correction, is the same way God does to us. But I must venture down the road in bad theology that I've heard all my life when it comes to discipline. But first, I've got to read you a statement. The, first, the statement that I want to share with you is this. The challenge is he's always a good father who disciplines. But are we good children who receive it or run from it? God is, God is a father that will always discipline because it's part of his goodness. It's part of his character. He innately is always instructing us, teaching us, wanting to perfect us, mold us, shape us. We are always under construction, just like that freeway that you drive on. And you say, oh my God, it's been under construction for 10 years. Well, as long as you walk this earth, you are under construction. And that's the role of the Father to be able to discipline us, to be able to do that. But the challenge, he's going to do his job, but for us, are we going to let him do it? Are we going to welcome it? Or are we going to run from it? Like the strong terminology is, will we be illegitimate? Will be, excuse the word, will we be bastards? Will we be spoiled children? Lord, I only want to receive your blessings, but don't correct me. I've heard that all my life. Pastor, I want you to mentor me. You know what? You want me to mentor you as long as I say what you want me to say. But you don't want me to mentor you when it's in a corrective way. Then I move from your pastor to reverend to brother Diego to Diego. <laughs> based on the level of correction. You know what I'm talking about. And if we can't even receive correction and discipline from a man, what makes us think we could really receive it from God? And the man that will never love us as much as God loves us. But it shows the weakness within our character along that line. So I, I don't know about you, I'm gonna use a term, I don't wanna be baby kids. The baby kids don't take no discipline. And I don't want to say you're a baby kid. I almost want to tell Pomona, look around and say, I'm not talking to you. He's not talking to you. You're not a baby kid. Come on online. Talk to yourself. Or talk. I'm not a baby kid. Then you got to receive discipline. You got to receive discipline. But I, I, it's important that we understand, again, what discipline looks like so that we could have a clear understanding of it. So here's the thought. When God disciplines us, he's not going to discipline us with something he paid for on the cross. God does not discipline with sickness and disease. God does not discipline you with an accident. God does not discipline you uh, with a disaster. And God doesn't discipline one with death. But you could grow up with a theology and a religion that teaches that kind of discipline. That God's trying to... God trying to get even with you. God has a bat in his hand. Uh, people say, so I'm going to step away based on what you said because I don't want that lightning bolt to hit me. That, that's a petty, insecure God that has to use those tactics to get your attention. That is not God. And there are so many people that are mad at God today or parents innately said that to their children about something that went on as a tragedy and put the blame on God. And people grew up with this misconception of what God looks like or how God disciplines. So I want to bring some thoughts that might be familiar to us. We've heard this, misconceptions. This is an act of God. Whenever there's a tornado, you'll have, you know, people on the news. This is an act of God. You think God wanted to make 
that tsunami or that volcano kill all these people? And you'll hear people that are atheists, if there's a God, why? Where did that come from? It came from people who said that they thought they were the spokesmen of God to explain something. God is not trying to teach you something. Again, he's not trying to, you know, put a sickness and disease so that he could get you on your back so that you finally can be quiet and listen to him. I'm a natural, I'm a father. There ain't no way that I put cancer on my sons to teach them something. That's hard for me to relate. I would never do that in the natural. And the Bible says I'm an evil father compared to him. He's not an abusive father. So you got to understand you're not trying to teach. God's trying to get your attention. That's why that's accident or death or tragedy. God's mad at you. God's getting even with you. God's, God's after you. In terms I've heard all my life, maybe God's punishing you for something you did. Uh, it reminds me of a story of a, a, a guy who had a German shepherd, like a, a protective dog, and, 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 he named, and he named him Jesus. And so one day a burglar broke into the house and the man turned on the light. And, and, and the burglar looked at him and the guy said, Jesus is going to get you. He said, what do you mean Jesus is going to get me? I, I don't believe in God. He said, Jesus is going to get you. I told you I don't believe in God. And I'm about ready to hurt you and rob you. He said, Jesus is going to get him. Get him, Jesus. And that's the way people think. They think Jesus is going to get him. And he's going to get even. My final point here before I move very quickly. If, you're, if you believe your theology is right, based upon what I said, that he's some kind of mad, vindictive, retaliative God that needs to punish you with something, then why don't I see it in Jesus' ministry? Because Jesus is the express image of the Father. I don't do anything, Jesus says, that I don't see the Father do. You would have to see in Jesus' three and a half ministries where he caused judgment to come upon somebody, where he said, now you are afflicted with a sickness and disease. Let that building fall upon you now. Let two, cra- I don't know their means of, tra- let two camel- camels crash into each other and you fall off and break your leg and can't go to work. If you can't see it in Jesus' ministry, then you can't prove it. You can't prove it. So it's important for us to understand again what the what of discipline may look like to help us. You're familiar with a bonsai tree. Bonsai trees are beautiful, but how does it become the beautiful bonsai tree? It has to be shaped and pruned and cut and disciplined. If not, it has all the potential to be beautiful, but it stays in a state of wildness and unshapedness until the owner begins to discipline it. That's the father. Let's look at the next one. Let's look at the the how here, I believe, of discipline. Let me read you a scripture. Every branch in me that does not produce fruit, he removes. Now, I'm going to teach you about this word remove. And he prunes it, every branch that produces fruit, so that it will produce more fruit. So, so this, this is a discipline. But this word remove, I wanted to keep it there. Remove, the mistranslation is he gets that thing and he throws it away. He completely removes it out. That's not what this word means. The picture here is that like of a vine or a fruit tree where its fruit or the weight of the branches are so heavy they have fallen on the ground. And so to produce fruit so that the insects in the ground does not steal the fruit, it is propped up and lifted up like with a piece of wood and now it produces And God's using that illustration. Many of you, your branches are now on the ground. And the ground and the disease is devouring your fruit. But because I discipline and love you, I will now lift you up and prop you up over the weight of what you're carrying so that you could produce more fruit. So as we talk about how how discipline looks like, to us, that's the analogy that I want to give to you as, as we launch this thought out today. So here's a few examples how God disciplines. Like Jonah, he'll discipline us in uncomfortable places. 
Sometimes we may not want to obey God. Sometimes we may not want to go places he wants us to. And so there's a fish's belly which represents an uncomfortable place so that he could teach us in developing a character. So sometimes he allows circumstances in our lives to bring about a maturity. So for nine years, I worked full-time at a job. and I worked in the church nine years for full-time. And then the church goes through a split. There's infidelity. I'm not the senior pastor. Uh, I'm just an assistant pastor, but it happens. So I'm out of a job now. The only job, and, I, and I, believe me, I searched high and low, and the only job I found or could get was a third shift at a parcel service. Now, why didn't God provide a suit and tie job? Why didn't God provide a nine to five job? Why didn't God provide a good lot of making money job? Why did I have to go in on Sunday night at 12 midnight and the rest of the week at two in the morning? Why did I have to uh, use my back so much in a labor intensive job? Why did I have to be at a job that I thought was so beneath me? Because God says, I'm going to use this to discipline you. Because where I'm going to take you in ministry, this big thing called abundant living, I need you to understand what pain looks like. Because the pain you're going to experience in the future is nothing like the pain you're going to experience now. So I'm going to teach you how to appreciate uncomfortable places. You don't understand. I learned so many lessons that I've transitioned into this church with, but unless I allowed God to discipline my character and teach me things, I don't know that I would have been as productive in ministry if I didn't go through those places. So I'm in a valley at that particular time. Or you could be like the rich young ruler that is disciplined by Jesus because he hoards his money. So the First way God could discipline you is through uncomfortable circumstances. The second thing way God disciplines you is he disciplines you through his word. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof and instruction. How many times have I been reading the word of God and said, ouch, oh my God. I'm not all that in a bag of chips. I've fallen short of the glory of God. Man, there's an ouch there. You get the switch, there's a spanking there. But it's not to destroy me. It's to grow me and perfect me and build me up. So God uses the word of God to do that in in the area of discipline. Like Peter, it's being confronted by Paul because of his hypocrisy. So sometimes God uses people to expose the wrongness that's in our lives. And so sometimes God uses people to call out something. Like, slow down, you're speeding, and you get mad at them. But who knows what accident is going to be prevented. Could be a colleague at work that tells you, dude, man, you're coming in late. Ouch, that hurts. Who do you think you are? Well, it could be God using a person to bring about discipline in our lives of training and correction in our lives. Then it could be like David when Nathan calls him out because of uh, Bathsheba's relationship with him. So God uses authority figures to discipline us. God uses authority. Parents are authority figures. Pastors are authority figures. You know, so, so you could have spiritual mothers and fathers in your life. They're authority figures. And, and obviously there could be governmental leaders and we pray for that. But anyways, like David... Like David who, get, who cuts Saul's robe. What happens after David cuts Saul's robe? It says he's get conviction and consciousness. So God disciplines us through our conscience when we get convicted. David cut the robe. Virtually hardly no one saw him do that. But he walked away saying, ouch, on the inside. Man, I shouldn't have done that. And sometimes our own very conscience, can, when we're watching something we shouldn't be watching, looking at something we shouldn't be looking at, saying something we shouldn't say with, and like five minutes later or 24 hours later, it's replayed in our minds. We say, oh my God, what did I do? What did I say? So you're being, you're being disciplined. At that moment, we repent and, and we say, Lord, help me. Holy Spirit, come and, and, and shape me and mold me. And then the next example that I want to give you today 
is uh, God disciplines through laws. In Romans 13, he talks about the laws of the land. So God will use laws to discipline us. So, I mean, you break the law, you pay a price. So the laws are there to protect us, the Bible says in Romans 13, to watch after us kind of thing. So, I mean, if I'm speeding all the time, you know what, um, and I keep violating that law, who knows if I could get in an accident so I could, I, I could get mad at the devil because I'm going to have to pay a you know, $300 speeding ticket, but I violated a law and God's using that law to discipline me or, or whatever it might be. But it could be like, it could be like Samson. Sam, did God, God disciplines because sometimes what we sow, we reap. And he, li- he, he liked wrong girls. Leave that girl from Timnah alone. Do not marry outside your faith. She's a Philistine. She doesn't know God and she'll turn your heart. What are you doing with this Gaza, this prostitute from Gaza? And now you're with this one man named Delilah? Brother, you're going to have to reap what you sowed. So I'm going to have to discipline, but I'll bring you back. Your hair will grow again. We'll revive the calling in your life. Sometimes God disciplines us because we reap what we sow. And last of all, God disciplines us through the Holy Spirit. Because the Bible says he brings all things to our remembrance. He's the spirit of truth. Uh, And he leads us and he guides us. So the Holy Spirit may just show you something and talk to you with an inward voice of discipline or correction. I think about my life, and there's a lot of examples like you I could think of, but the one that comes to mind that happened like recently is the Lord is having me to watch the words that come out of my mouth. You know what the Bible says in James, out of one side of the mouth says one thing, out of the other side, blessings and cursings. So my mouth could be used hopefully like right now to help and to bless and to encourage but this mouth could be used in a negative way. Now, when I'm first saved like you, sure, they're cuss words. I mean, sure, they're violent words, threatening words, stupid words. That's not what I'm talking about at this season of my life. But it seems as though I freely, when someone doesn't meet up with my expectations, though I don't tell them in their face, in my mind, muttering in my voice, I said that, whatever incompetent person. That, that would be a realistic response. Incompetency. Incompetency. Lack of excellence. Lack of excellence. You know, some, somebody, you know, probably like you, every time I get on the freeway, why do all the bad drivers show up when I'm on the road? That's, and so I, I freely would say something like stupid, fool. And guys, I don't want that out of your mouth no more. Life and death are in the power of the tongue. We're going to give it, stand before God and give an account of every word that comes out of your mouth. So I'm taking you now, Diego, to a higher level of training. You're moving to another thousand elevation. You're going to feel some pain now. But I'm trying to take you higher. I'm trying to take you higher. I'm trying to take you higher. You could stay at this level right now and be in shape and fit at the 3,000 level. But I'm trying to get you up to the 10,000 level. Diego, you're not a a stable horse. You're a thoroughbred. Now, do you want to, don't be claiming I'm a thoroughbred when you, when you want to act like a stable horse. I'm trying to get you to an eagle, but you're gonna, you're, your lifestyle is going to stay as a parakeet. I'm trying to bring out the Bergatti in you, but all you want to live like is a Toyota Prius. No offense. They say you could build a Toyota Prius in about 15 days. It takes a Bergatti six months. Everybody wants to claim the Bergatti. But it's the discipline. It's the work. It's the effort that it takes to be that, that God wants from us. So let me end with this now. Let's talk a little bit about the why. Let's talk a little bit about the why. Here's what the Bible says. This is three scriptures that kind of we read. For they discipline us for a short time based on what seems good to them, but he does it for our benefit. So the why is our benefit. Make a better husband, better father, better employer, better employee, whatever your, your, your goals or your visions are, it's benefit. Next word, please. Next scripture. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he removes and he prunes it. Every branch that produces fruit so that he may bear more fruit. 
So the discipline is so that you could have more fruit. You could get better. And here's one more. I love this one. Poverty and disgrace comes to him who ignores instructions, but whosoever heeds reproof is honored. I don't know anybody that doesn't want to be honored, respected. Here's another word for this. Watch this one. Promoted. You know how many times in people in ministry tell me they want promotion, but they will not go through discipline. They won't go through discipline. And God says, I will honor, respect, and I will promote those that will come under my discipline. If not, I've got to keep you at a certain level. I can't promote you. And so we see the why now. We see the why of discipline. Because if we read it again, it produces holiness in our lives. When you and I go through the stages of discipline, then it's going to produce a level of holiness that's in our lives then it's going to produce a level of peace, the Bible says. You're going to walk at a level of confidence and a level of assurance. It's going to produce righteousness, which just simply means you're going to respond to people the right way and you're going to do the right thing. Then it produces, we just read, honor, which is promotion. It, it's going to produce fruit. You're going to be more like Jesus. I don't, that's my prayer, God. I just want to be more like you. And it just seems as though, at least for me in this season, I keep missing it. And it's not because I'm an extremely bad person. It's because I'm getting closer to Jesus. And I'm wanting to be more like Jesus. And so to be wanting more like Jesus, then I, the closer I get to him, it, it exposes the wrong that's in me. And again, I might be living at the 3,000, so I'm really doing good, but God wants to bring me to the 10,000. So I'd almost feel like, God, God, can I go a whole day? Without feeling reproved or chastened or my being sore a little bit. Felt to just yesterday on a film shoot. All day long filming, filming, filming with a secular Hollywood crew. And at the end of it, I looked at them and I thanked them. But I thought to myself, this whole day I didn't share the gospel with them. Why didn't I take advantage of that one moment and say, guys, I just want to end with this with a word of prayer. Because I'm flesh. And I can get distracted, and I'm not some super hyper Christian, but I'm a, process, I'm a per Christian under construction. But I felt a little bit. Why? Because I want to be more like, more like Jesus. And last of all, it produces strength. Discipline will give you a strength that is so needed to overcome, to have, be victorious, and to triumph in any area of your life. I, I, end, I end with this. How many of you, growing up or even now, uh, don't like the smell of a food or the taste of a food, but the food is good for you? Yeah. <laughs> Ever seen a kid that won't eat something that's good for him? Come on, Pomona, say something online. Put spinach in front of them, broccoli in front of them, Brussels sprouts in front of them, peas in front of them, collard greens in front of them. Nobody made noise. I guess you like collard greens. The younger people don't like collard greens, mama. They don't like, they stank and they don't want them. But anyway. Or when I was a kid, you know, castor, castor oil, that it fixes everything. You were congested, plugged up. And then sometimes the things that God gives us don't feel good. They don't taste good. But they really do produce something great in us. I end with this and every... A person, a girl or boy, is familiar with a glove. When you buy a glove, it is very, very stiff. You know that, ball players or people that did that. You can't buy a glove right off the shelf and then go play a game. That thing doesn't open and close, and you'll probably, it'll go in your mitt and it'll fall out. This thing has the potential for greatness. This is the way God, this is a Christian. This is, this is what we look like. We are perfect. But you, what you have to do is you have to get lubricant yeah, you and you have to lubricate it. Or old school, you'll put a, a baseball in there and you'll close it up and you'll put it under your bed or something heavy and smash it. Ball players, you'll see them, they'll get, a, they'll get the ball of the bat and they'll pound it right here. Pound it, pound it, pound it, pound it, pound it until it, begin, it becomes pliable and soft. And that's the way our lives are. When we get saved, this is what we are. We're, we're beautiful. We have all the potential in the world, but we're, we're not broken in. We're not pliable yet. But God's discipline 
and working into the leather and the strings and the groove of our life now makes us very, very productive in, in it's our purpose. And I just want us to have an understanding today. God loves us. It's part of being part of his family. And I want you to look at discipline maybe the, a, a way that you never looked at this. So I shared with you how God is disciplining me. Every one of you that are Christians should be able to tell me right now where God is disciplining. If not, I don't need to tell you that. We've shared it today. You are a baby. Just say it. Admit it. I'm a baby kid. I don't want to call you that other word that it said. Where am I being chastened? You might be chastened today because you don't tithe. You might be chastened today because you, you just come to church and you don't volunteer. God is not going to let these things go away that are important to the productivity of the kingdom of God and what he's created us to be, a student in the word of God, a soldier in the word of God, an athlete in the, in, in, in the kingdom of God, in the things of God. So, Father, right now, we want to just take a moment to repent of how we've been running from your discipline. We didn't know. Maybe we didn't understand it, but now we're held accountable, God. May we learn now that you are trying to take us to a whole nother level of productivity and accomplishment and success. And so we ask you to speak to us with clarity, God, and we promise we won't ignore it. We'll try to the best of our ability to do what you've asked us to do, to obey you and to follow you, oh God. And though discipline does not seem pleasurable at the moment, it's painful. It produces a great gain for your purpose and for your glory. So we welcome now your discipline of correction, your discipline of instruction, whatever that may look like, God, to bring about fruit in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Hey, thank you guys for watching and thanks for listening today. As I conclude, I want to just thank you today for uh, watching us today, wherever you are at. But being around church and listening to the word and hearing about Jesus doesn't mean you're going to go to heaven. Doesn't mean you're going to go to heaven. Unless you have repented of your sins and confessed that Jesus Christ is Lord of your life. It's not proximity that saves you or familiarity that saves you. So many people have grown up in church or around church or heard the things of God or are familiar with Christmas and Easter and uh, had, a, they even, a lot of people have a Christian name from the Bible. And we've had grandparents, we've had teachers, and you know a lot. It's not like you're ignorant, you know a lot. Do you know that the devil believes in God? He knows there's a God, but he doesn't serve him. It's his creator. God created Lucifer who back, who rebelled in heaven and became what we know today as Satan. The reality is this, if you ask him, do you believe me? He said, of course I believe in God, but I don't believe he's my Lord. I don't believe he's my savior. And I don't, I don't believe that I'm to follow him. And there's a lot of people who believe. You have to ask, well, what do you believe about him? Do you believe he died for you? No. Do you believe he's the only means of salvation? No. Do you believe that he's the only one that could forgive you of your sins? No. Do you believe that he's the only way? No. So you could believe in Jesus, that he's a guru, a philosopher, a theorist, theorist, a miracle working God, a leader of a movement, a parable teacher, whatever you want to believe. But do you believe in what he said he was? And so I want you to judge your heart today. And if you're ready to accept the Lord or rededicate your life to the Lord, you're hearing now something. You're feeling something now. It could be a little bit of the instruction and correction and chasing of the Lord to draw you into a relationship today. That's all that is. If you feel something, then respond to it because it's the Holy Spirit now drawing you into a relationship. Just say, Dear Lord Jesus, I give my heart to you in everything I am. I really believe that you died on the cross for me, but I don't know how to serve you now. But I invite the Holy Spirit to give me the empowerment and the strength to do it. I love you, Jesus. Help me. Amen. Hey, thanks for watching, and we'll see you next week. God love you. God bless you.
Congratulations. We are so happy that you guys said that prayer with us today. We are happy because you're gonna take your next steps while you follow Jesus for the rest of your life. So you may be asking, hey Ashley, what do I do for these next steps? You go grow.faith. That's grow.faith to grow your faith in Christ. There you will find a couple resources from my father-in-law to help you grow in your faith, grow in your walk, and then just get closer to God. And if you wanna help us continue to grow the gospel and to spread the gospel, because you know here at Abundant Living Family Church, we seek the lost, teach the found, and then we send the disciples. What you can do is you can help by giving today. And there's two ways that you can give. You can give at alsc.faith, or you can give on our PushPay app. And we can't wait to see you guys soon. Feel free to either stop by ALFC Rancho or ALFC Pomona, or continue watching us online. Bye guys. And Josh, this camera angle is killing me. <laughs> I'm literally like, I'm looking at it and I'm like, thank you. I'm like, can I stare at the camera? Golly.